to the to the trocar should be tight and should be very in. Okay. So what is against laparoscopy in regarding to the smoke that uh, get, that is uh, em, uh, emitting all this virus? Uh, excuse me. The ultrafiltrate of the aerosolized smoke particles in an enclosed space is very possible. Because filtration of aerosolized part particle in open surgery is not feasible. So this is very good actually for laparoscopy. But against laparoscopy, what, which is a kind of surgery that we use so much of this uh, electronic uh, surgical instruments like uh, cautery, ultrasound, and we cut, we dissect, we do hemostasis using bipolar, monopolar, and ultrasonic devices. So we are all dealing with smoke, which we, we don't usually in laparotomy. So what is bad in laparoscopy? They say that the ultrasonic system cannot be used because the, the heat that is produced by the ultrasonic system is not enough to deactivate the virus. They recently, they have an experimental study showing that after 10 minutes of laparoscopic dissection by electrocautery or, uh, or by ultrasound, the concentration of particles measuring 0.3 to 0.5 micrometer is higher, was higher with laparoscopy than with laparotomy. And owing to the low rate of replacement of pneumoperitoneum gas, the leak aerosol may contain high concentrations of suspended viruses. So there is always that risk of contamination of the healthcare workers, which may be greater in laparoscopy than in laparotomy, particularly if the accidental gas leakage occurs or exsufflation is poorly controlled. Next slide. Now, finish with the choices. We now go to the operating room. How, how to mitigate the risk inside the operating room? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. American College of Surgeons tried to divide the cases of gynae, okay? So that they say the emergency gynecological cases cannot be done because uh, you cannot do your PT, RT, PCR test right away. So they want you to do laparoscopy only for the non-emergency gynecological cases. And these are as follows. Sterilization procedure, surgery for fibroids, myomectomy, hysterectomy, surgery for endometriosis, for adnexal masses, surgery for pelvic for floor prolapse, surgery for urinary and fecal incontinence, and I will not touch um, hysteroscopy. But they require you to do RT-PCR first. So ecto ectopic pregnancy, agnexal torsion, rupture of tubo ovarian abscess, tubo ovarian abscess not responding to conservative treatment and acute and severe vaginal bleeding. All these are emergencies. Emergency, so they don't recommend. They don't recommend. So you have to open them up. Okay. We're just lucky as ob -gynes. All our structures are responding to hormones and we can delay our surgeries. Unlike other fields, there is no medicine to treat. So, next slide, please. So, no, no, this slide is okay. This slide is okay. No, for apparent, uh, so we have to go for proper patient selection. They have, they have a study that showed that apparent COVID negative patients after elective surgery, the risk factors for proof pro poor prognosis in the event of post operative development of COVID 19. These are these uh, patients are the those with the advanced age, comorbids, or the increased surgical time, or the surgical complexity of the procedure, which is the the big myomas, big uterus, and all the big ones that you have to mercilate before you get out. 
Okay. So they say that there is a greatest risk of ICU admission, 44% versus 26% than the paired patients who did not undergo surgery. So the pre-op preparation. Next slide. So everybody is very familiar with this screening questions. Fever, dry cough, fatigue, myalgia, headache, diarrhea, and, and the travel history. If the answer is yes, then you have to refer them to the specialist. Get clearance for COVID-19 if you want to operate on them. If the answer is no, then you can proceed to do a RT-PCR ASAP. Okay. Next slide. If the RT... If the RT PCR result, take note the RT means uh, real time reverse transcriptase, meaning to say this is a retrovirus, very hard to detect. The RT PCR result currently is within two to three days before the surgery, uh, the, the schedule of the surgery. That's the running time. If you can have it, have it in two to three hours, that's the best. Okay, so the endoscopy or the laparoscopy is deferred until the results are undoubtedly negative for COVID-19. Take note, there is a 33% false negative. Okay. For emergency cases where the RT-PCR cannot be done, then endoscopy is not the route of choice. So, next slide. Pre-op preparation for the patient. You should inform the patient on the risk of contracting COVID-19 as a nosocomial infection, resulting in greater morbidity and mortality. This should include informed consent. In areas for more than 40 active cases per 100,000 inhabitants, it is suggested that all patients planning to undergo surgery should have a diagnostic test for COVID-19 up to 72 hours before surgery and be quarantined. I don't know where, until the time of the hospital admission. And this is from Clermont-Ferrand in France. Okay. So that concerns the patient. How about your co-workers, your hospital care workers? Do you take care of them? Yes. So these are the next slide. These are the technical measures for preventing contamination of the healthcare workers by COVID-19. So... Please take note that you should you use the close technique of uh, obtaining pneumoperitoneum because the open technique is larger. The hole will be larger. And sometimes you have leaks and you have to suture again. And this is that will be crazy. The red you have to reduce the pneumoperitoneum pressure as much as possible without compromising safety. You have to reduce the power of electrosurgery, not maximize, but you have to reduce and ref. And this ultrasonic dissection, I think you have to abandon. You cannot use them. You have to systematically use laparoscopic smoke as aspiration system. You have to systematically use particle filters. Very expensive. Prefer intracorporeal anastomosis. Extract the excised tissue after complete emptying of the new peritoneum and fully aspirate the new peritoneum before removing the last stroke card. Very important. So during surgery, what are the three important things that we have to take into consideration? It's the pneumoperitoneum, it's the smoke from the electrosurgery, and the smoke and evacuation. So let's start with the reducing the pneumoperitoneum. For theoretical risk of aerosolizing the virus in the abdomen, reducing the volume of pneumoperitoneum required for the operation may reduce this risk. This can be achieved by the operating at the lower pneumoperitoneum pressures. And I think 12 to 15, everybody agrees with that. As long as your bowels are empty. Okay. So next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay. Depending on the case, laparoscopy or laparotomy, surgical smoke can contain water vapor, inorganic pollutants, organic pollutants, and biological pollutants such as cancer cells, bacteria, and fragments of viral DNA or RNA. So laparoscopy has added 
a further source, source of airborne pollution, namely the aerosols generated by pneumoperitoneum gas flow. So one plus one, meaning to say CO2 gas flow plus the smoke plume from the surgical uh, electrosurgery. Next slide, please. I cannot help but share this slide. This is an uh, unlaparoscopic mouse model. The effect of carbon dioxide on, new, uh, on the peritoneal cavity. It was stated that carbon dioxide pneumoperitoneum induces acidosis and enhanced adhesion formation. So that there is mesothelial hypoxia as the driving mechanism. And how is this? How, how does this happen? There is a uh, upregulation of the plasminogen activator one. There is upregulation of the VEGF, and there is upregulation of the hypoxia inducible factors. I cannot help but share this one, a plasminogen activator one, which is part of the cas uh, coagulation cascade. And as we all know, one of the uh, way that the patient, uh, the COVID-19 patient dies is because of hypercoagulability from the cytokine release. And one plus one is not good. So can will, will the pneumoperitoneum created by the CO2 add, uh, be detrimental to a patient undergoing laparoscopy whom can be a candidate of a COVID-19 infection. So you're only adding to the cascade. Okay, next slide, please. So reduce the power of electrosurgery and ultrasonic dissection, which shouldn't be used already. I will tell you why. In laparoscopy specifically, all the studies of aerosol are related to the electrosurgical smoke produced in a closed environment and the consequent aerosolized debris into the suspended particles from the energy devices. You see the table at the right. The best way to kill something is by electrosurgery, La then laser, then ultrasonic scalpel. You see the size of the plume that can, they can produce Electrocautery is less than 0.1 microns, 0.3 microns per laser, and 0.3 to 6 microns ultrasonic scalpel, telling you that the ultrasound cannot kill anything. So that the ultrasound system often used do not produce enough heat to deactivate the virus. Next slide, please. Although the ability of the aerosolized COVID-19 in the abdomen is unknown, minimizing the electrosurgical use and the avoidance of certain devices such as scalp, uh, ultrasound scalpel may reduce aerosol aerosolization of particles in general and thus reduce the potential of risk of viral emission. Now we come to the third problem, which is how to evacuate the smoke that was produced during the surgery in that con contained uh, compartment. Next slide. One should create a closed circuit for insufflation with the use of smoke evacuator device to avoid any release of pneumoperitoneum into the room, which we don't use. I don't think Philippines has. But with this, I think you have to think twice before you use. Okay. So next slide. Um, Additionally, desufflation at the end of the operation should be done through a smoke evacuator device or direct suction. When this is done, care should be taken to evacuate the abdomen under direct vision for as long as possible and placing the tip of your choker or suction away from the bowel, either resting above the liver or turned towards the abdominal wall. Okay. Next slide. Any specimen to be removed should be done at this time of the operation with the abdomen distaflated already. Let us remind ourselves, next slide please, of the filtration system. I think everybody knows this. We have the HEPA, we have the HEPA filter and we have the ULPA. Okay. The HEPA can only remove 0.3 microns. The ULPA can remove 0 0.05, 0.05 microns. So 0.3 microns means bacteria, 0.05 maybe 
uh, virus. And take note that the virus, the COVID-19 virus I've read, is the longest virus with a size of 0 0.04, uh, 0 0.06 to 0.14. Okay. So now we go to the uh, commercially available evacuators, smoke evacuators with filters. If you uh, go into the journals, they will all tell you about air seal and the pneumoclear, the Buffalo smoke management system. But the, our country, I think, will be import, uh, Medtronic will be importing rapid vac soon. Okay. So they are all used in open and laparoscopic surgeries. They all use ULPA, which is 0 0.05, removal of 0 0.05 microns uh, particles. You see, among the three, CONMET has the best filtration uh, activity. It can remove 0 0.01. Okay. And all are using active, active uh, participation of the surgeon. Okay. Next. Uh, just talk a little about the CONMET air seal. This is one of the first sophisticated insufflator system. It is intelligent flow system control unit. Why is it good? Because it's valveless. It comes with a trocar. There is no valve. So you won't accidentally switch the valve to an open mode. At, at, and you can smell all the smoke there. So this is valveless access port with small circumferential CO2 nozzles within the trocar as opposed to the one-way valve, which minimizes any loss of pneumoperitone during the instrument change. We don't have this, so I cannot, I don't know how to des demonstrate. I think they have a CO2 inflow and CO2 outflow in the same tubing and uh, pressure monitoring and filters. Okay, next slide. They, in the air, they, it has two modes, the air seal mode, and the smoke evacuation mode. In the air seal mode, the insufflated CO2 is recirculated rather than continually adding fresh, cooler CO2. And this is very beneficial for laparoscopy and robotics because it decreases the fogging because there is no new air inside. However, the recirculation of the same CO2 may add to the theoretical risk of concentrating the aerosols virus further, which is dangerous. Okay. The other one that I've read about is the pneumoclear from Stryker. This one, next slide, uh, is an uh, integrated insufflator with a smoke evacuation system, dual lumen. The other feature here is that you can desufflate the abdomen at the end of the case. However, it uses traditional trocars, so major dan dangers also. Okay. So the next two slides were, are, are the other brands. Okay. How about in places where there will be no smoke evacuation system available? Okay. So, next slide, please. Next slide. So, when a smoke evacuation system is not available, several groups have described using direct suction of the uh, laparoscopic smoke uh, through the trocars to uh, allow for evacuation of the smoke. The filtration of the surgical smoke can be integrated with the use of filters removed from the endotracheal tubes or other devices. However, this method cannot guarantee the high filtration efficiency of the manufactured smoke evacuation devices. So everybody should have advanced PPE and N95, probably the part, CAPR. So after the surgery... We should also take care of our fellow men, okay? The healthcare workers, the manos, and everyone, okay? So this is a uh, slide showing the organizational measures for preventing contamination of healthcare workers by COVID-19. So you should train the healthcare workers in protective measures. Set up separate circuits for patients with COVID-19 or suspected of having COVID-19 or certainly non-COVID-19 patients. Have as few healthcare workers as possible in the operating room and bring in things only to be used. Avoid movement or changing of healthcare workers during laparoscopy. Ventilate the operating room. It should be ideally a negative pressure room. But if you don't have, then you have to allow 30 minutes after each surgery to disinfect. You have to manage... Uh, 
ways appropriately during and after laparoscopy and have to encourage the surgical team to leave the operating room during the intubation and the extubation phases. Take general hygiene measures, hand washing, cleaning, and furniture and, the, and the instruments, etc. Next slide, please. So respirators to be, wear, to be worn by the healthcare team will be N95. Take note, N95 can only remove 0.3 microns or larger, meaning bacteria only. Okay, the non-medical grade, I think. The PAPR, however, will be beneficial for those who will, under, who will do the intubation, extubation, bronchoscopy, endoscopy. And I've read somewhere that it is also ideal for those who can have, cannot have a good fit test for their respirator. Okay. So after the surgery, we go for the post-operative care. We should practice ERAS protocols and should be carried out to optimize same-day discharge. Follow-up plan should include standardized surveillance and use of distant health or telemedicine. Patients should not require a face-to-face -face visit unless there are complications that require physical examination. Conclusion. Harmful effects of aerosols from numerous peritoneum with the virus present have not been quantified. Measures for the protection of healthcare workers are an extrapolation of those taken during other viral epidemics, influenza, SARS-CoV-1, and MERS-CoV. Their results, however, cannot be extrapolated to laparoscopy. There is no expert consensus on the actual or extrapolated presence of the ambient SARS-CoV-2 in the pneumoperitoneum as factual evidence is lacking. So lastly, there is still much to be learned about the pathophysiology of COVID-19 disease and transmission of SARS-CoV-2. The virus and the disease are still evolving. Therefore, utmost care and vigilance must be exercised by the healthcare team to mitigate the risk in performing mix. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sulao Chao, for a very extensive um, review. No? And uh, thank you for sharing your perspective as a surgeon. I'd like to call now Dr. Pichai to share from her vantage point, no, uh, her perspective as a hospital administrator. Okay, can we have the slides of Dr. Apichai? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, Dr. Pichai, we can hear you. Okay. Good afternoon to all our listeners and our colleagues who are tuned in. I hope you are safe, healthy, and COVID-free. The role of the administrator is totally unprecedented. This has never happened before. And so in preparing for this lecture, I had to search the net and look for areas where more or less the management of this outbreak has been somehow a model. And I looked at, in my first slide, please, what happened in Singapore. This country experienced the SARS outbreak early in 2000. And from there, they were able to draw the steps to mitigate and manage an emerging infectious disease outbreak. What did they do? In this situation, they had to unmask SARS coronavirus 2. So the mode of transmission, as we now know, is like The clinical progression is wide range. It can be a COVID positive who is asymptomatic to somebody who is seriously ill and could die. Rapid testing was set up. They have a lot of rapid testing capabilities. And this can be uh, released, the results can be released in a very short time, not days. From there, they were able to prevent, mitigate, 
for the treatment, they're still working on it. Immunization, we're still looking for it. Maybe in one and a half to two years time. They were able to establish a formal platform for multi-department and cross-agency coordination, as well as having a clear, accurate, and timely transmission of information from trusted sources. In my next slide, they have identified what institutions should do in times of outbreak. So they have to adopt institutional practices. Let's look at what happened to us. We heard about COVID-19 last few weeks of 2019. We were very much aware of this when the Chinese tourists finally died from COVID-19 at our ITM. And this brought to fore our challenges in managing this outbreak. And so we had to have collaboration for the first time. It's very unified. Collaboration and coordination with other units, institutions, and organizations here and abroad. We have to do teleconferencing like this one. We have to make guidelines, clinical pathways, and protocols that are data-driven. We have to provide enough isolation rooms and beds, ICUs, even operating rooms for suspects and confirmed COVID patients. The negative pressure, I don't know if there's a hospital here with the negative pressure isolation room. It's not readily available and it is expensive. We had to educate not only ourselves, but also the public. In the hospital setting, we had to train from security guards to the janitors. We had to ensure adequate supply of PPEs and disinfectants during the first weeks of uh, February up to March. This was a huge challenge. And then the informed consent has to be revisited to include the clause that what we know about this pandemic is, is still evolving and that the patient should understand the risk they have to face should they elect to have surgery. Next slide will be what the government has been doing. This is March 31, and this came from the Office of the Department of Health with the issuance of an interim guideline in the expanded um, testing for COVID-19. Now, please understand that the test we're having is not 100% accurate. At best, it is 60 to 66%. The rapid test is something like uh, 30 to 50%. CDC says it's 50%. I'm not aware what tests we are using in the country. That's why knowing that this uh, virus is very contagious, we have to be very careful and cautious in dealing with patients who are suspected with the disease. Next slide is the beat COVID-19 today summary. This is usually given every day by the Department of Health. If you are tuned in in your radios or in your televisions at five, five o'clock, in the evening, you have an update. Today, we have something like 15,000 cases and 900 plus deaths from COVID-19. Among the ASEAN regions, Singapore has the most number, but the number of deaths they have is two digits. It's not even reaching 50. We are number three in the most number of cases among the ASEAN countries. So number one is Singapore, number two is Indonesia, and we are the third. Next slide would be policies we have adopted to allow new best practices. And I think for as long as we don't have the immunization, this will be the norm. So social distancing, and from there, we now encourage to work from home. Wearing of masks and PPEs, I'm glad that Dr. Rasuala was ahead of me because she has to explain that this micron size is not enough or, or can penetrate the usual mass we are using. The PPEs, I hope we have an abundant supply of that by now. We have to do frequent meticulous hand washing, regular sanitation surfaces because this virus can survive in droplets on surfaces. 
We have to register patients and clients for quick contact tracing, but unfortunately, some of us do not give our real names and exact addresses. And then we have to quarantine people who are suspected, probable, or those with positive COVID tests. Next, please. So this is where most hospitals would devote their resources. Proper donning and doffing of PPEs. This has to be in two different rooms, not in one room. You have to split your staff. A staff, a set of staff to attend to COVID patients and another set for non-COVID patients. Not only for that, but also for units. Modify procedures and techniques. This has been well elucidated by Dr. Azualau. Then you have a headache, the compensations. So aside from the regular pay, you now have to give hazard pays. And we're glad that the government is responding to it because frontliners who get sick from COVID-19 will have few health compensations. You also will have to give psychological support because when they go out wearing their uniforms, there is this stigma. And so they are shunned by some citizens. Then when it was um, total lockdown for Metro Manila, they didn't have uh, public transport. And so we had to board and lodge them within a certain building in the hospital. Next slide. Next, please. So this is the appeal health circular that was released with um, compensation for health care providers and others concerned just in case they get infected with the virus. Next slide. So the real challenges would be in this slide. A summary of what Dr. Asuala was saying. On the right of the screen would be how a hospital works. So you have to have the structure and that is the hospital building, then the personnel, then the equipment and supply, which would entail a lot of funding, and then the processes to make everything work. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we now have the challenges on the left slide. So shortages of equipment, and then the staffing concerns, and of course, the steep decline in revenues because we are practically attending only two emergent cases. Next slide. So this pandemic continues to be felt as hospitals in all countries reduce elective and non-urgent cases to allow staffing and resources to be devoted for COVID-19 uh, patients. Urgent gynecological and cancer procedures are continuing and it is imperative on the part of hospital administration to be protecting them <clears throat> and also in mitigating or lessening and reducing viral transmission as we operate on asymptomatic suspected or confirmed COVID-19 patients. Next, please. So mix at the time of COVID, this was alluded to previously. So Morris and associates stand by the benefits you get from uh, MIGS. Cohen is of the opinion that sure, we have to prevent the uh, transmission to patients um, of your staff being contaminated and getting sick from the infection. However, in emergent surgery cases, he's saying that if your patient is untested, or is COVID-19, laparotomy should be performed. Next slide. So the next step, this was discussed and presented during the FIGO webinar last week. It is saying that each, each institution must ensure that the availability of hospital beds is not adversely impacted by a decision to resume elective surgery. In other words, if you are a COVID hospital, maybe you have to set up another building for non-COVID patients. That's extreme. No? Then the personal protection of patients, companions, and caregivers must be ensured. And lastly, the consent. Patients should have read and understood the peculiar characteristics 
of this public health emergency and the risk inherent in performing elective surgeries during this pandemic. See, what we know about this pandemic is still evolving every hour, every day. Next slide, please. All right, this was um, also discussed previously, a positive pressure operating room, which is actually our operating rooms. It is so, so that airflow from less sterile areas cannot enter our operating rooms. However, the spread of aerosols would be faster if you have a positive pressure uh, operating room. So a negative pressure operating room or environment would be favored. But again, this is expensive. It's not uh, widely available. And so a high frequency of filtered air exchange may help reduce the viral load within the operating room. Next would be in the next slide, anesthesiologists colleague. Because when they do intubate a patient for say laparoscopy, they are undertaking aerosol generating procedures. And when you do this, you have a high viral road load in respiratory secretions. So during intubation, only the anesthesiologist and maybe her assistant should be in the room. All, everybody else should be outside. The same would be true in extubation. And this has been explained fully by the first speaker. Next slide. Okay, this was also alluded to and explained fully. We can still not quantify, but it has been shown that Viral DNA can be detected in surgical plumes after the use of surgical energy. Electrosurgery, somebody was asking, eh kung bipolar, electrosurgery pa rin yan. Laser and harmonic scalpel. And actually, this um, viral DNA being extruded in the smoke was first documented when they were treating HPV but these are usually in the skin. And my last slide, next please. The presence of this coronavirus two in blood and is two specimen. Their presence in extra pulmonary regions of the body would make them more infectious or are they also infectious or what? As far as their presence in the vagina is concerned, it is conflicting. There was one documented report in a menopausal woman <clears throat> that was in um, the AAGL and exchange last time. And yet the 10 patients of severely infected COVID-19 patients in China did not show the presence of this virus in the vaginal fluid. And so what we know about this virus continues to evolve. So with that, what is the role of hospital administration in this pandemic? Tremendous. We're losing revenues, and yet we have to produce all of these gadgets to protect our staff, our patients, and our clients. With this, I bid you good afternoon and more safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pichai. Um, again, thank you to the panelists for sharing, and we appreciate the views shared from different vantage points. So we've had some questions in the Q&A and some in the chat box. I'd like to start off, Dr. Pichai, yeah. uh, uh, fielding some questions to you, if you don't mind. No? So. Oh, yeah. Um, there are several questions on when we can resume MIGS, and I mean, that's a big concern for all of us. Can you briefly recommend um, just key indicators that will allow resumption of elective MIGS? Mm. Very good question. Everyone wants to go back to their yeah. old lives. <laughs> and hospital administration wants the revenues back. Yes. Okay, key indicators. Are the numbers of deaths in COVID-19 in my community going down? I'm not going to count on the number of cases because look at Singapore. They have the highest number of cases, but 
they have very low mortality. Next would be, do I have abundant supply of PPE? So you're saying, sure, everybody's negative, the patient, the staff, everybody. But listen, the examination we're using is now 100% accurate. So the risk of an infection is still there. And so you still have to use your PPEs. Uh, next would be that the habits of your staff has been established so that they can protect themselves. They can be very cautious. They're mindful of not spreading the virus and of not infecting themselves. So again, I look at the way Singapore did theirs in um, managing the outbreak. There was um, early on this uh, severely uh, infected COVID-19 patient in the ICU. And the 41 hospital staff who attended to this person, not even wearing PPEs, but surgical masks and gloves and gowns, and were very conscious of their uh, environment and not spreading uh, hand washing, meticulous hand washing, did not get the infection when this patient was discharged. So once that becomes a habit, then yes. And lastly, and most important, when everybody in the PSG are experts in the subspecialty. In other words, you can finish the surgery on time. Do not prolong it. Well, some hospitals have tagged, for instance, La Prost, we have 200 minutes, so that's what, uh, 20 half hours. If you can shorten it, so much the better. But my goodness, for hospital administration, you have to have Lots and lots of funds because mm -hmm. PPEs are one-time use. Yes. And then I, I guess because the circumstances of our um, across the nation is very different. You know, it will really be dependent on how their local situation is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, if you would ask me, where would I do it and be feeling uh, kind of relaxed? Mm -hmm. Maybe the island province of Bohol, because they don't have a reported COVID, or in the city of Richard Gomez, where is that in Ormo? Because in also it's, it's uh, COVID free. Okay. Anyone from the audience or from those areas? You heard Dr. Rapichai? Yes, in <laughs> <It's>, my <class. laughs> Yes. Um, I, I, I know that you discussed this earlier, Dr. Rapichai, about the ideal operating room for COVID positive or COVID negative patients. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, in, um, in the Philippines, we don't really have, um, not all hospitals will have designated rooms which are COVID positive or COVID negative. How, how do you suggest that we can retrofit it so that you know, we can use one for COVID positive patients and uh, what kind of room do we need for those that turn out to be COVID negative? I know what I was uh, looking for pictures, there's so many, but see, um, we ought to have, or we, we ought to have the numbers. Like if we set it up this way, what is the incident that patients who are operated in this setup would not have the disease or not. So, um, just be mindful of the droplets. Be sure to contain them. Next would be please, please, please protect your health providers at all costs, at all costs. So a setup, they're all in the net. Mm -hmm. And I trust the Filipino um, invention or inventors are everywhere. We can always survive. They're very innovative. Yes, I think that's the, the term. We need some innovation so that we can equip our operating rooms that would be safe both for the patient and for the staff that will be performing surgery. There's um, a last question, if you don't mind, Dr. Rapichai. And um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, are there any additional contents for the consent form for MIGS? I mean, should we add anything? Um, for informed consent for the patient? Mm, hospitals should have, say, um, maybe a flyer containing what we know about this infection. And then have these patients really sign after reading and understanding this consent. 
so that you know you will not end up with the litigation the word evolving should appear in that content because what we know now may change tomorrow mm-hmm. agree totally thank you dr pichai um thank i know you. there's a yes po. i know there's a need for the modification of standard practices to minimize any risk of transmission now yes. i have some questions for chow <laughs> chow congratulations again like dr pichai gave an excellent lecture now, a uh, concern in performing laparoscopy is the enhanced risk of aerosol generation with dispersion of body fluids during insertion and removal of trocars, prolonged exposure, explosive loss of body fluids at colpotomy. No? Um, what would be the recommended pneumoperitoneum pressure during laparoscopy to reduce the volume of aerosolized particles? I think uh, I think uh, it's in one of my slides. I think that you should be contented with the number twelve. If you're happy with that kind of pressure, you can. Uh, you have to do pre-off uh, ball prep, so that other things are not there except the feed that you want to operate on. And you should be very careful that you can do it. So in some of the journals, they even say that it can only be done by proficient doctors. Okay, so the size that you want to remove down there should be small, so that you don't have to mercilessly. You can put it in a bag, suction out all the fluids, no fluids remaining in the cavity, in the plastic, in the holder of the specimen, then suck out all the, the smoke, then finish. Then maybe the perineal girl cannot even take a look at the, at the perineal area. Put in a clump, stay away, face stay away, then remove the, the bug. <laughs> Agree. I mean, it's very difficult if you were the vagina girl <laughs> and you have all this um, sudden escape of um, fluid and pressurized air. Um, so there should not be any air anymore. It should be flat. Okay. So the, 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 the mouth of your bag should be shoot into the bolt, everything, before you suck it out. Suck out the air, suck out all the blood, Blood first before the air, then collapse, then pull out. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, what would you think is the ideal maximum duration of laparoscopic surgery during this time? I mean, we agree that you know the shorter it is, the better, less exposure. Um, can you give us a sort of like a guide on how long um, surgery? They, did, uh, they didn't, uh, in all the journals, they didn't say anything. They just say it's about uh, one hour, you can finish everything in one hour. So pre-off evaluation is very, very important. What kind of cysts are you removing? Uh, is it very adherent? You should be very good at your ultrasound. Is it cystic or is it solid? Is this a small uterus? Uh, so if for big ones, they, they all indicate for big ones you cannot do. Okay. Again, um, thank you for that. There's another question, and I think you answered it earlier, but can we can you just reiterate, no? How does one minimize body fluid or blood escaping on specimen removal? I think that's a very important point to, to remember, no? Uh, for me, I think uh, you have to put everything inside a bag, as for the fluid inside that strong bag, okay? Then leave it in somewhere else, then aspirate everything down there, all the fluids that you can aspirate, then shoot the bag, the mouth of the bag, plastic bag, to the vault, mm-hmm. to the vault, then uh, suck out all the gas before the perineal girl can put her hand into the vagina and remove the bag. Okay. Thank uh, you I, for- I, don't think, I don't think you can remove this from the umbilicus. Mm-hmm. Unless there's a string there, which Ange is using uh, tied into the bag, uh, string out of the truck car, but still it occupies a space that where the air can es- escape. Mm-hmm. Uh. So um, you really have to remove the pneumoperitoneum prior to either you do a mini lap or you tr- go through the vagina. There should not be any pneumoperitoneum at that point. So the smoke evacuator, I think it will be very good, but I don't know how much how much it is. Uh, and I think it's a disposable one for everyone. You have a, 
you have a new, for every new case you have a new one okay and i think it will be best if it's the screw type to every valve you have to have the screw type even your suction tubing and not the one that you have to cut and shoot mm -hmm. in everything okay if you have to shoot in everything during ors biglang natatanggal ay to das na <laughs> yes so we have to have a closed um secure system Oh, okay, and also the valve, valves of the truck cars. They have been reusing it and it's been so loose mm -hmm. in other hospitals. Mas kinabago. Mas mm -hmm. kinabago. It's quite loose now as compared to the early, earlier ones. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching for 20 years and I think the screw type will be better, the one without the valves for the accessory ports. Um, so I think that's an important point to remember as we resume MIGs in the future to double check our system, no? to make sure that um, we're dealing with a closed system and um, that's less likely to just open or give I've way. Read, uh -oh. I've read one that the trucker should be placed very high, the one that you want to evacuate your smoke. Very, very high so that you can get everything inside, not at the dependent portion, meaning to say the one near the umbilicus. The smoke evacuator uh, tubing should be connected to that one. I, I saw earlier, Chow, in your slide that um, there was a slide that mentioned the evacuator should be quite high, no, near... Yes, yes, that's the, the one. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the one. It, it, it specifically stated that it should be anti-dependent. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll move on to uh, Dr. Prudence. So SARS-CoV-2 is largely transmitted by uh, respiratory droplets and the highest transmission risk arises when undertaking aerosol generating procedures. Now, um, it was brought up earlier that both electrosurgical and ultrasonic devices create large surgical smoke, theoretically increasing the risk for viral transmission. Can you share some tips on how to minimize the surgical smoke? And the second question is, can you share some tips on how to remove trocars and specimens with minimal carbon dioxide escaping. Uh, this was earlier um, answered by Chow, but can you share your opinion about this? Uh, thank you. So, uh, so uh, Dr. Chow actually gave a lot of, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Hi. So Dr. Chow actually already mentioned uh, uh, an answer to this one, but I, I prepared some slides so that we can just uh, summarize uh, the answer. Je Dr. Jeff? Uh, slide. Slide. Uh, slide, please. Slide for me. Here. The second set. All right. So this is the question uh, posted earlier through the email. Uh, which was read to you by Dr. Rabada. So let me answer question number. Actually, this was answered by Dr. Chow, but let me just put all her answers together. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so how should we minimize the smoke? There are three components that we need to consider. The production, removal, and we need to combine these two things so that we, we can minimize the surgical smoke. What is so much concern about the surgical smoke, COVID or non-COVID, the surgical smoke actually has a lot of chemicals which are mutagenic, carcinogenic, found in several studies. So this will answer one of the questions in the chat box. That's why we should be uh, active in uh, removing the surgical smoke whereas before we just uh, opened the tap and allowed the, the smoke to come out but nowadays it made us realize that this is not so COVID or not COVID we should practice uh, to minimize surgical smoke during laparoscopy next so we look into the production looking into devices that we use for hemostasis next 
So it has been mentioned that with ultrasonic scalpels, it produces a lot of surgical smoke. And even with a lot of smoke, it does not actually deactivate the serial components of the virus. That's why there is still risk of uh, transmission when you are dealing with unknown viral status of the patient. That's why Dr. Chow kept mentioning there is, even if you're COVID negative, there's a 33% a chance that there is, you're an asymptomatic carrier. Next. Now, as to the device, we look into the particles that they actually can, uh, can uh, break down and, and become suspended and, ha the, and then uh, making the risk for aerosolization. So with electrocautery, they can actually make the particles very small, less than 0.1 micron, and they can suspend this in air. Now, comparing to laser ablation, 0.3, and comparing to ultrasonic scalpel, only 0.35 to 6.5 microns are the sizes that they can suspend in air, the sizes that they can cut with the device. And that being said, next slide, they actually create a lot of smoke. So we don't like smoke because there's poor vision. Next. So looking into this study by Well, they look into uh, how much smoke bipolars, uh, harmonics, and your monopolars create. And with, with a lot of smoke, it is it, equivalent to a lot of aerosol production. So we want the relative visibility to be, to be high. So we find in this study that the bipolars have a high relative visibility versus monopolar. So there was a question in the chat box, which is better, bipolar, monopolar. But according to the study, it seems that you better stick with bipolar if you want to do dissection hemostasis versus monopolar and your harmonics because it doesn't create so much smoke and hence not so much aerosol production. High concentration of small particles are most responsible for the deterioration of laparoscopic vision. So bipolar and ultrasonic instruments ap uh, appear to cause least deterioration of visibility. But you must remember in the earlier slide, it's the harmonic scalpel well, where we do not kill the virus. So between the two, it appears that bipolar, or be among the three, it's bipolar that seems to be your best option. Next. Now, this is mentioned before, how to minimize circle smoke. You have to choose a uh, lower setting, how low is low. So you have to avoid charring because when you char a certain tissue, you release toxic chemicals. And if there's a, the patient is a symptom uh, carrier of virus, then uh, that will add to the uh, hazardous, hazardousness of the smoke that you create. Desiccation time, how long? So they say that you do not stay long in a certain spot. How long is long? So this was mentioned in the studies uh, featured by Dr. Chow. In this study, they looked into the concentration of 0.3 microns and 0.5 micron particles with electrocautery. And they looked into the length of the desiccation. At 10 minutes, they noted there's an, uh, they reach a maximum of small, small particles in the area of desiccation. So that means that you do not stay long in a certain area desiccating for 10 minutes. The shorter, the better. And between a blended and pure cut, you stick with the pure cutting mode. Next. So now we go to removal. How do we remove the surgical smoke so that we can minimize it during laparoscopy? Next. There are three ways to do this. One mentioned is you need to have a closed evacuation filtration system. Second is that you must have a working suction system, the traditional one. And the third is that we can attach sterile tubings to the trocar tops and goes into a direct, directly attached to a surgical smoke out of the abdomen. Now for the number three, you need to have clearance from their infectious committee if they will allow such a deflation method. But even if it's if, if, even if the surgical smoke goes to a cell contain, you still must allow uh, clearance from your infectious committee uh, uh, yeah, of the hospital. Filtration, filtration system. What is ideal is the ultra low filtrate particulate because as mentioned, it uh, removes your system. Uh, you may use this if you don't have the closed uh, smoke evacuation system, but this is not enough. You need to, uh, like what Dr. Pichai said, you need to invest in this, uh, in, in this uh, filtration system to keep your surgical staff and your patients well safe. Next. 
Correct. So there's so many surgical smoke evacuator in the market. What should we be looking We should be looking at a system where there's ultra low particulate filtrate air filtration. And not only that, that you can use it for both open surgeries and laparoscopic surgery. And then that there's the evacuation should be active. Hindi pwedeng ano, uh, passive lang. Plus, uh, it would be nice that if you already have an existing uh, tower, you can just have to add on something, an independent system. Because otherwise, you will, you will if you want to buy the entire thing, it will cost lots and lots of money. As it is now, we're spending so much on PPE, COVID testing, additional cost burden on the patient. So you must have to think, do we just, is it better uh, economically just buy an independent system that will that is uh, compatible with your system? There's mentioned earlier that uh, there's one uh, evacuator where the CO2 is recycled. It's very nice because the, the particle that you actually uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, suck out is smaller than 0.1. But the problem is this same CO2 is recycled. It is good because it makes the abdominal cavity warm. There's anti-fagging. But the thing is there's a, a theoretical risk of putting back a virus in back into the abdominal cavity if it exists. And then lastly, and then next is that trocars. For the uh, high-tech one, where you have the CO2 recycled, which is very nice, no? mentioned earlier that there is a specifically designed trocar for this. Uh, and uh, again, this is added cost. You also have to think that for the independent system where you can work with what you have, the trocars. Just make sure that you are able to use this system uh, well so that even if you have uh, lots of uh, surgical uh, smoke, you can actually clear the, the view and clear out your smoke uh, uh, in a nice combination. But if you have the money, why not? But if you're tight budget, having an independent system with all these features would be a good alternative. Also, we have to consider that the sound it makes when you use your smoke iba. We normally have a, they're very, very noisy, irritating to the ear. So you must consider also this, that the decibels they produce should be low because they can really be disturbing. And lastly, there should be an after-sales service that can be there for you uh, in times of need. Next. All right, so the next question was, uh, can you share tips on how to remove trocar specimens with minimal carbon dioxide? Same. This was already mentioned by Dr. Uh, uh, Chow, but let me just put in a few words. Uh, next, all right. So for the accessory trocars, you have to remove at the end of the procedure. Now, this is difficult. This is, uh, it is opposite to what we've been taught. Accessory trocars are not removed are removed under direct vision. This time around, we remove them with no direct vision. So we have to be careful as we remove. If we deflate, like Dr. Chow said, try to keep it away from the intestine. Or perhaps when you're very sure the deflation, lift your, your abdominal skin so that you can carefully uh, remove your tokar. Now for the primary part, the removal is the same under direct vision. Anyway, you do that towards the end when all has been deflated. Now, there will become a problem if your accessory trocar is more than 5 mm. You need to suture them. Before, uh, before COVID, uh, we, need, we, used, we would use a fascia cutter or a suture passer to, to get the fascia on both sides of the 10 mm, uh, more than 5 mm slit on the uh, abdominal skin. Abdominal cavity. And if you stick a needle in, you might cause uh, escape of uh, surgical smoke or CO2, which we do not like. So the recommendation is that when you remove your top car of 10 mm, is that you just use a J needle to get those uh, fascia on both ends and tie them. Next. And as to removal of the specimen, I think Xiao mentioned this, no? Uh, it's at towards the end, put them in a bag. And uh, there is a, there's one doctor who put in a, uh, a gloves over the area, over the port where the specimen needs to be removed so that it will prevent uh, ex uh, release of CO2 left behind and uh, explosion of body fluids. So in summary, 
these are the recommendations which uh, was put forth by the group of Malik and they see that these are not these are all expert opinions because there's no study right now so uh, they just have strong recommendations so in summary you no know, they recommend use of energy devices during procedures when possible but when energy is needed you avoid the scalpel and you lose lower energy setting and based on the studies I put out between bipolar and, and monopolar you choose the bipolar uh, it is recommended that you use closed circuit smoke evacuation devices with high efficiency part particle air filter. Next. Next slide. It is recommended that you use a low pneumoperitoneum pressure, less than 12, 10 to 12, you can work with that. Because with less pressure, there's less chance of uh, air uh, aerosolization as you change your, your uh, instruments during surgery, and if you remove the choker towards the end of the surgery. Next is that you rec we recommend conclusion of operation to desufflate abdomen using smoke evacuation device or suction substitute. Next. So uh, that basically ends the, uh, there were some questions on the chat box, which I hope was answered uh, in, the, in my presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Prudence. Um, if there are still some questions, and I think we still have time, um, and I'll throw out these questions to the panel and whoever wants to answer, please do. There is a question here that since all patients for surgery are negative for the virus prior to, because we would advise pre-op testing, why do we worry about smoke escape during laparoscopy? Are those patients still suspect to harbor the virus? So let me answer that. Uh, like Charles said, there's a 30% chance that, that false, there's a false negative. <coughs> That's one. Number two, COVID or done COVID, a surgical smoke will contain uh, chemicals that can be carcinogenic, mutagenic, because the muscles can, can uh, create these fumes that are dangerous to the, can cause uh, inflammation to the bronchioles if they go into the those, uh, system of the surgical team. Okay. So there's a question for Dr. Apichai. Um, Dr. Apichai, maybe she's on mute. Dr. Apichai, yeah, yes. I can see you. Okay, Dr. They're, they're asking, um, you mentioned rapid antibody testing. Yes. Is this being done in your institution? And if such, what are the conditions to which they are required to do this? No. Uh, we don't recommend it in the hospital setting. It's uh, for LGUs where they want to identify, maybe in areas where you have a lot of uh, informal settlers. They just want to segregate who is COVID positive or, but this rapid testing should not, it should not influence your decision to do or not do the surgery. It should still be a 60 to 66% accurate PCR. I'm saying this to emphasize the fact that when you do surgery, when you attend to a patient, all of them are suspect, even if they have a negative PCR result. Mm -hmm. I think the, if I may add, the value of the rapid antibody testing is really just to check the prevalence in a community. Mm -hmm. And um, the validation of the numerous rats no, um, show that uh, they're not consistent. No? So it shouldn't be used. The ideal really would be the RT-PCR. So there's a question, um, which would you recommend for the OR, a HEPA or a ULPA filter? Oh, okay. It should be ULPA. ULPA. <laughs> go for ULPA. <laughs> the thing is, you're going to spend much, well, it ends with the patient paying more. Mm -hmm. um, there's How a, sure are you when the ULPA is uh, put into the suction machine mm -hmm. then, uh, then you use for another patient? The one that uh, adheres to your filter already, then you, then I don't know, that one will come back again to your other, to your next patient. Mm -hmm. Because okay. isn't it that the filter, that it will filter everything there? So mm -hmm. when you change it or when you dis just hold it and put it into another sucker, di ba babalik yan sa suction machine? 
So I think it should be a disposable one from the start. Okay. Each round, uh, there's a smoke evacuator that have one one way flow. So in no. that case, maybe you can use it. But ideally, you should change if we're dealing with uh, if you're afraid that there's a viral uh, asymptomatic viral uh, infection in the patient, even if she's negative on RT PCR because of the two to three days turnaround time. So one way, one way, oh, one way suction machine. Yes. Then the filter, you it can filter as much. Then when do you change that ULPA filter? Uh, that I don't know. Well, there's uh, the old. There's uh, they, a, they have a they have yeah, a they have their, what is the, indicator according uh -huh. to the the company. Yeah. No, 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 not the one they are selling. They are they are trying. To, uh, the question is, they are trying to innovate. Mm -hmm. They buy the HEPA filter, then they hook it to the suction machine. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, so that's, that's, that, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's dangerous. Uh, there's a question here that um, short of procuring a smoke evacuator, which is expensive, mm -hmm. is it possible to attach some of the laparoscopy tubings directly to an ULPA filter? I think that's the one that's... Oh, because yes, yes. Sure, right? Yes. yes. Because uh, the, the sizes of your tubings are, may not fit the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there is an independent uh, system where the tubing sizes uh, are according to, the, to our taps. So you can probably look into that when you want to purchase. Now, regarding uh, what Chow said about using the filter used by the anesthesiologist, theoretically, it can work, but you have to have it cleared by your infectious committee if they will allow this one. Because at the end, if there's something happens to your patient, they can always go back to, you did this. It's not, shouldn't have been done. So, meaning to say, we have to be honest to our patient. That's right. Yeah. We have to be honest to our patient and tell them they have to buy this. Yeah. For each case. Okay. Yes. For, um, there's a, another question that was asking in our informed consent. That's should right. we also include the limitations of what we have right now? Let's say the absence of a smoke evacuator or maybe even a, big COVID, uh, a negative pressure room or a positive pressure room. Should oh, that yes. be included in the informed consent? Yes. Everything. You have to lay your cards on the table. The last thing we want is a litigation. Mm -hmm. So they have to understand we have limited supply of this and that. Mm -hmm. Our operating rooms are positive pressure. There is this risk. And you know, patients now are so educated, they surf the net. For all you know, some of them are listening in and into this mm -hmm. webinar. Now I I can can I draw a question also? For yes. those who are doing open surgeries, do you use your cautery? You refrain from doing that also, because you you want to suck all them uh, the smoke out, isn't it? When you do your surgery before this COVID time, na nakalapit ang sucker, and mm -hmm. it's been uh, indicated that it should be one cm from the smoke for you to remove fifty percent of the particles. Mm -hmm. So if you're not doing it in your ordinary CS, the more you have to be very careful in laparoscopy because this is a high pressure thing. Then if you want to release it, you have to release it correctly. Mm -hmm. So there's one comment that um, we shouldn't use cautery when we do uh, surgery. And that yeah. goes both for the open and the lap. You know? Of course, again, I think it's more easily said than, than done, right? Yeah. Um, also, if you use cautery, you're charged additional. <laughs> That's why my generation was taught to, you know, suture and then uh, hand tie. Yeah, hand tie. Yeah. So we'll use a lot of cotton sutures now. Yeah. Um, there's another um, question. Apparently, Palace has a suction machine. Is anyone familiar with this device? Maybe Jeff would know. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if Jeff. Yeah, Doctor. Eh? Yes. Yeah, we, the the suction device that we're using actually is the is the improvised one, and then and what we also use as the uh, in our hospital is the rapid vac. So that's what we have out today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge Jeff, who's been very helpful for us in, under the telemedicine network. Um, I'm looking through the chat box and um, the Q&A. I think most questions have been answered except for hysteroscopy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go for hysteroscopy too. <laughs> I was going to ask Dr. Picha if she wants to preempt our next webinar. Our next webinar will be on hysteroscopy. Okay, let me get more data on the presence and infectiousness, quote unquote, of uh, SARS CoV 2 in the vagina. See, uh, critically ill without SARS CoV 2 in the vagina, it's um, you know, encouraging. But see, you have now to modify your moves. I wish we have Bigatti shaver. That yeah. would definitely lessen my bleeding. So I need not be using my, my loop and, and electropotent and create a lot of smoke inside. But if it is diagnostic, you can do that in two minutes. It's an outpatient thing. You can even do it in the confines of your office. Just be careful with the uh, fluid. So put on the fluid only if you are into the canals. Not in the vagina. If you're thinking of finding the COVID virus in the vagina, be careful. Maybe I would even use double gloves <clears throat> with my PPE. Mm -hmm. Agree. So that's actually a very nice introduction for our next webinar because we'll oh be goodness. having Dr. <laughs> Bigatti. Uh, yeah. so Maybe yeah. you can link with him in Shanghai. He's still there? Yeah. Oh, he okay. has agreed to be our guest for our next webinar. Mm -hmm. um, so... I hope our questions on hysteroscopy will be answered then. Uh, Dr. Pichai already gave us some uh, answers ahead of the webinar. Yeah. And maybe the uh, trophy scope, the small caliber scopes, they would be very useful now. We need them now. Yes. Um, I think we've answered um, most, most of the questions. Um, again, if you have any further questions, please feel free to email us or Q&A because we'll have a series of webinars after this. No? So um, again, no, I'd like to thank our panel. And um, before we wrap up, I'd like to ask the panel for any last comments or words of advice from, for, for us no, before we wrap up. Can we start off with Chow? Chow, can you unmute? I think you're still okay. Chow, okay. If Chow is not yet um, online, yeah, maybe we can ask Dr. Apichai for your parting words or advice. All right, hospitals now are hurting because of the steep decline in our revenues. We want these surgeries to come back in, whether they are emergent or elective, we will take precautions with what we have. We will try our best to produce them. In the meantime, I enjoy everybody to innovate, create, and collaborate more than ever. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you, Dr. Pichai. Chow, you're there. Any last uh, words of advice? Chow? Okay, now we'll ask Chow. Chow, can you hear us? Although she cannot hear us. Okay, well, Prudence, do you want to go ahead? Okay, so thank you everybody for participating, for listening to us. But uh, as parting words, COVID-19 rules, unfortunately, still ruling us. And our society came up with a, a statement, hopefully to guide you into finding out if you're ready or not. And hopefully this webinar is a way for you to guide your hospital institution if you're ready to restart. So the indicators that we have listed is that you RT-PCR, are you comfortable with a two to three days turnaround time? Ideally one day turnaround time is, very, is the best. Then you will be comfortable to proceed with your surgery the usual way. Otherwise we go through 
this process of uh, making sure everybody is okay, full PPE. Uh, if you're going to a positive pressure uh, room, OT room, you must tell the patient or a negative pressure room and all the things needed with that. And we must also realize the importance, COVID or not COVID, a smoke evacuator system. Uh, you have to ask your uh, infectious, system, uh, infectious committee if the do-it-yourself is okay with them. And of course, you have to tell your patient. So uh, laparoscopy, when clinically appropriate, achieves the goal that we have always been espousing because it is an op optimum patient care, patient goes home right away, we minimize the surgical risk so that uh, not only to the surgeon, but to the rest of the team. So we are just waiting for the statistics of COVID to settle down and we should all be ready to go back to work. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Prudence. Um, Chow, can you? Yes, I hear you. Okay, you Thanks. What's the question? Oh, no, I was just, we were, I'm asking for any last piece of advice to our audience. Maybe in this pandemic time, do not innovate. Okay. Um, again, I'd like to remind everyone that this situation is ever evolving, right? And the advice may change as the consequences of COVID-19 infection and its method of transmission becomes more greatly understood. For there's just still so much that we have to learn. Now we'd like to thank you all for joining us. But before we wrap up, I would like to call Dr. Marinel Abatni. She's the secretary of PSGE, the present president of the Philippine Society for Reproductive Medicine, chair of the Department of OBGYN of the Victor Potenciano Medical Center. Nay? Thank you, Mom Tonet. I would just like to introduce uh, our, uh, our sponsor. Uh, may, may we welcome Ms. Rowena S. Orke from the Professional Affairs and Clinical Education for Philippines Minimally Invasive Therapies Group of Medtronic to say a few words to all of us. Ma'am Wang. Good afternoon. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rene. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I give my final words, can I just give um, uh, airtime for our senior product specialist, Ms. Rose Adrao? To talk Hi, about, uh, yes, to, to just discuss a little bit on rapid back if there are questions that need to be addressed. Tayron Rose. Hi, good afternoon. So uh, first, I'd like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, showcase our product. Of course, the rapid vac, our smoke evacuator. Uh, evacuator. So this is a heavy-duty, multifunctional um, smoke evacuator. So it can be used both for lap and for open procedures. So um, it has also a... Uh, um, um, a power of a uh, power range of 57 uh, decibels at 44 cubic feet per minute and of course um, i'd like to highlight um, some of the benefits of this one um, first it is easy to use and set up so less learning curve for the doctors and for the nurses because um, it it's easy to replace the filters uh, understand the controls install the tubings number two it is it is effective um, we have a ulpa filtration system it's a four-stage, uh, four-in-one filter system, so with a 99.9% .9 efficiency rating. And um, economical, third is economical. Um, it has a three ports, uh, uh, so no need for pre-filters and adapters. Plus, it, it, we sell it in a, at a very reasonable price. Okay. And lastly, is, it is quieter. So mm -hmm. from the previous model, this one, uh, is, uh, it produces, it's less likely to produce loud sounds. Okay. So thank you very much again, doctors. Yes, and then um, Dr. Rene, I would just like to take this opportunity, of course, to thank um, PSGE, um, led by Dr. Prudence Aquino, and the Vice President, of course, Dr. Habana, Dr. Pichai, Dr. Raswalao, Dr. Rene, and the rest of the uh, society. Um, it's truly a pleasure to be working with you and we're hoping for a long-term partnership also um this is our third webinar series in partnership with the telemedicine network of the philippines so this is actually we also we already have um upcoming webinars so with different national societies thank you very much dr jeff domino our boss in tnp Dr. Kathy and Dr. Kay as well. And then please watch out for our next webinars. As you see with Medtronic, no COVID or no lockdown can ever hamper or stop education. So thank you very much again for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Ma'am Wang. So on behalf of the Philippine Society for Gynecologic Endoscopy, we would like to thank all of you for attending the first PSGE webinar. An evaluation form will be sent to your email. Kindly accomplish the form so we can issue a certificate of attendance to you. So again, we would like to thank Medtronic, Ma'am Wang, and Ma'am Rose, Dr. Jeff of Telemedicine Network of the Philippines for partnering with us this afternoon. So thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you again in our next webinar on hysteroscopy in the time of COVID and intrauterine bigati shaver with Giuseppe Bigatti himself as the speaker this June. So stay safe and good afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Congratulations, Space GE. Thank you. Thank you, Mamwe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next time, may ano laptop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can okay. I have a photo? Photo. Mera, may picture na, Doctor. I will send to you sa Viber. Okay. Kasama ka? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Uy, salamat, uh, Jeff. Ana. Pati ikaw, nag-answer na. Oh, oh.